we are going to begin discussing supply. So let's start with an introduction. You are a small, you own a small company that produces surgical masks for a hospital. The hospital buys masks from many small companies and pays $3 per mask. If the hospital starts paying $5 per mask, you should produce more masks or fewer masks. The answer here is A, more. And we think that as firms, as prices rise, firms will produce more masks. And as prices fall, firms will produce fewer masks. And we, this is uh, something we probably intuitively understand, right? Well, if someone's going to pay me more money for it, then I'll produce more of them. And we can generalize this to all goods. The law of supply is a principle that states that as the price of a good rises, the quantity supplied will increase, all else held constant. And I put this up here because I think this is sort of intuitively something we understand. And what we're going to spend the next few slides doing is thinking about why this is. So let me uh, turn to an example with oil. So this is worldwide oil consumption in billions of gallons per year. And we can see this increase. In 26 years, worldwide oil, worldwide gasoline consumption increased by 109 billion gallons. That's a lot. 109 billion gallons is the approximate volume of all living humans. Wolfram Alpha, the search engine gave me that. Weird measure, but I thought that was kind of interesting. It's the approximate volume of a cube that's a half mile on each side, or it's how much water goes over Niagara Falls in 40 hours. So where did all that gas, extra gasoline come from? Well, it came from places like this. This is the Perdido oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. It opened in 2010. It's 875 feet above the water. That's what you see. And it goes down 8,000 feet below the water, as you would probably expect. It costs several billion dollars per to build. And so large investments like this are only worth the cost if the price is high. So we're only going to see this oil rig and the huge amounts of oil it can supply if the price is high. So we're going to, so when the price of oil goes up, we're going to see oil companies do things like this, which increases the quantity supplied. So let's look at an example of a supply schedule. We had a demand schedule before, I think it was the demand for movies. Now we're going to look at a supply schedule. And so we'll say that at a price of 400, our firm is going to produce 2,000 units. If the price falls to $325, then we're going to be producing fewer units, right? Law of supply says that when price increases, produce more. So when price decreases, we produce less. So price would fall to 1750. Price falls even more to 250. We expect our quantity to fall even more and so on. Well, if you remember what we did when we had the demand schedule, we said this is sort of nice and we could see for five different sets of prices how much we're producing. But this doesn't really tell a full story, right? So what if the price of oil is $350? How, what the, how much, what's our quantity then? And so to answer a question like that, it helps to draw a supply curve. So let's put some points on there. If the price of oil is 400 and we're producing 2000, that's gonna be represented by this point here. 325 price, 1750 quantity is right here. And we could fill the rest of them in. And as was the case before, all that's left for us to do is connect the dots. So important lesson from today, supply slopes up. When price increases, quantity supplied increases. It's one of the more, that's you know, another really important fundamental from this class. Demand slopes down, supply slopes up. Now what we're going to do is learn about changes in supply. We learned about change in demand, now we'll learn about change in supply. So the law of supply is a principle in economics that states that as the price of a good rises, the quantities supplied will increase, all else held constant. Well, what we're going to think about now is what do we mean by all else held constant and what happens when all else held constant changes? So what happens when the price of a good goes from $5 down to $3? We'll start with this. That's movement along the supply curve. Remember how we said that what a demand curve is made for is for telling us questions like, how does quantity demand change when price changes? 
The supply curve is made to answer questions like this. What happens when the price of a good goes from $5 to $3? Well, in this case, that means we're going to start off here at this point and move down here to this point. That's movement along the supply curve. Movement along the supply curve. Again, that's what the supply curve is made for. We don't have to move the curve. We're not moving the curve around because the curve is set up just so they can answer questions like this. And in this case, the answer, what it tells us is quantity decreases from 500 to 300. Price went down, so I supply fewer. So a change in price is movement along the curve. That's what we just saw. A change in something else leads to movement of the curve. So for example, suppose environmental regulations on oil companies are reduced. Well, we know that initially supply looks like this. It's upward sloping. Now this environmental regulations changing, that is something else. That's something, we're responding to something other than a change in the price of oil. We're responding to a reduction in regulation that's probably gonna reduce our firm's costs. That is going to lead to an increase in supply, meaning supply shifts to the left. So now let's think about, the, compare a decrease in quantity supplied to a decrease in supply. So remember, a decrease in quantity supplied occurs when we move from one point on the supply curve to another point on the supply curve. So nothing changed about how much we like making the good. All that changed was the price went down, so we're producing less of it. We can compare that to a decrease in supply. So again, this is a change in something other than price. So we had the example of regulations going away. That means supply shifts to the left. So now let's look at an example. Other things remaining the same. Now let's look at an example. Other things remaining the same. An increase in the price of Uber rides decreases the supply of Uber rides, increases the supply of Uber rides, decreases the quantity of Uber rides supplied, or increases the quantity of Uber rides supplied. The answer here is D. This is an increase in quantity supplied because notice nothing changed about how much people like Uber rides, how much Uber drivers like giving Uber rides. All that changed was the price. Next question. East Lansing decides to limit the number of Uber drivers and the number of hours a newer Uber driver can work. This decreases supply, increases supply, decreases quantity supplied, increases quantity supplied. The answer here is A. This is a decrease in supply. So what's going on? Well, we had our supply curve did look like this. And now holding price constant, the fact that we have fewer drivers available means supply is going to shift to the left. We have fewer rides available and it's not because price has changed. It's just because of the restrictions limiting the number of drivers. Next, we will learn about taxes and subsidies. So federal excise taxes are a pretty good place to start. It's a fairly um, straightforward um, example. So federal excise taxes are per unit taxes on items that are sold. They're off. So the main things we have gasoline taxes, um, which is hot, which we're talking about highway here. Um, aviation, I believe that's the 911 security fee. So every time you buy a plane ticket, there's a couple dollars in there for that. Tobacco, alcohol, those are both um, things that are that the government taxes. So um, there's an 18.4 cent tax on every gallon of gasoline, dollar one tax on a pack of cigarettes, thirteen dollars and fifty cents for one gallon of a hundred proof alcohol, which is a really weird measure. Just it's basic. It's about two bucks on a 750 milliliter bottle of liquor, approximately. It's also a 10 to 11 percent tax on guns and ammunition. You do not directly pay these taxes if you buy the good. There's no line item on your receipt when you buy a pack of cigarettes that says $1 tax. 
And so for now, we're just going to think of these as an additional cost to the supplier. How would we expect an increase in the cigarette tax to affect the supply curve of Philip Morris, which is a tobacco company? Right? We would expect that to be a decrease in supply, right? That's going to lead Philip Morris to produce fewer cigarettes because it's now more expensive for them to make them. The other side of thing are things are subsidies. Governments can subsidize industries or firms it wants to help out. So if there's something we like people we will producing, we want to encourage it, well, we will often see them subsidized. Subsidies often take the form of paying firms to produce a good. So here's a couple of examples. Muskegon Airport is a little tiny airport in Western Michigan. It has two outbound commercial flights a day. Both of them go to Chicago and it received a subsidy of $61.33 per passenger in 2016. So every time a person got on an airplane in that Muskegon airport, the federal government paid the airline $61. And that is because the federal government likes having these small airports around. Um, they're used for emergency landing, um, landings for commercial airports. They're also, I um, mean, there's also a general feeling that it's good for people in rural areas to be able to um, have access to commercial flights. Another example, energy companies using wind or solar power received the $2.8 billion in subsidies in 2016. So the idea here is the public benefits from cleaner energy. So the government will, to encourage production of cleaner energy, will pay subsidies to energy companies. Uh, here's an example from the news. China's pork prices soar, adding to Beijing's troubles. So I believe this uh, is related to some tariffs or trade restrictions, restrictions that the U.S. put on exporting pork to China. And as a result, people who are in China were starting to, were having to pay higher prices for pork, which made them upset. And so the government has been try, have, was trying to figure out some way to alleviate that. So China's central government has also announced a raft of measures to encourage farmers to begin raising pigs again, including subsidies for building or expanding farms. Some subsidies offer as much as $700,000 to those who take up the charge, so who will open a pig farm. So how do we expect a federal subsidy on milk to affect the supply curve of a dairy farm? We have movement up the supply curve, movement down the supply curve, the supply curve shifts out to the right, or the supply curve shifts out to the left? The answer here is C. We have the supply curve shift out to the right. That is an increase in supply. Because again, even if the price doesn't change, so if I'm selling milk, even if the price of milk doesn't change, I'm going to be producing more milk because every time I produce a gallon of milk, in addition to getting paid by who I sell the milk, milk to, I'm also being paid by the government. Next, let's discuss determinants of supply. Remember we talked about what determines demand, what can shift demand. We're gonna do the same thing for supply. So here's some of the determinants of supply. We're gonna talk about resource costs, technology, price expectations, and the number of sellers. We'll start off with resource costs. So this is a picture of a steel mill. Suppose you own a factory that produces stainless steel. You could sell this steel for a dollar per pound. If electricity became more expensive, would you make more steel or less? I think we would agree that you would probably make less steel because a couple of your costs went up. So a resource is any item used to produce a good or a service. So electricity is a resource used in the production of steel. And an increase in resource prices results in a decrease in supply. That's the example we just talked about. Electricity goes up, we reduce our supply. A decrease in resource prices results in an increase in supply. So this is, I think, a really cool graph. This is the historical cost of computer memory. And it's on a log scale. So every time you move from one of these big bars to another, cost has gone down by 90%. Because every time you go up, it's a 10x multiplier, which means that you see that there is this very long period of time from around 1970 all the way, continuing almost all the way to the present, at least to around 2010, where every 10 years, cost went down by 90%. And so if we think about this as a resource cost for electric gadgets, this should increase the supply of electronic gadgets. And so we can think about in 2001, this is the original iPod. It had a five gigabyte hard drive. It was a hard drive that actually spun, so it used a lot of battery. 
Uh, it costs four hundred dollars. There is they do still make a an iPod. It's the iPod Touch. It's basically an iPhone that doesn't that you can't make calls with. Thirty two gigabytes of flash memory. It's also got a full screen touch screen. You can play games on it. You can surf the internet if you're on Wi Fi, and it costs half the price of that original one. So you think, and there has been a big increase in supply. So. 2001, it was basically a niche product for people who are into technology and real audiophiles. Now it's become, you know, iPhones and iPod and iPods are very commonplace because historical cost is the cost of computer memory has gone down. So you've had an increase in supply. The next determinant of supply is technology. So this right here is called a flying shuttle. It was invented in 1733. Um, it's used for um, weaving fabric and it made it much faster, um, largely because you could use one person instead of two on the loom. And so what that led to is a big increase in supply for fabric. Um, this was, I think, one of the things that led to people being more likely to buy fabric from a store than producing it at home. So an increase in technology increases supply. So even if the price of fabric stayed the same, what we're going to see is if I have a factory I, and I can now essentially produce it maybe for half the cost, because instead of having to pay two people to run a loom, I can pay one. Well, that is going to lead me to increase my supply. New technology can reduce production costs and shift supply out. On the other hand, if a technology is no longer used, then the supply curve will shift in. Why would we do this? What are some reasons for a reduction in technology? Well, usually it's because we have something like it damages the environment. We find this out later or we find out that it's dangerous. So, for example, lead paint. Lead paint um, apparently was very good paint, you know, bright colors and lasted a long time. But then we found out it was horribly dangerous. So now we do no longer make red lead paint. So that in a way is a sort of a reduction in technology. The next determinant of supply are price expectations. Remember with demand, we said that even if something um, isn't changing right now, if you think something's going to happen, the, happen in the future, that can affect your behavior now. So let's think about how that, how that relates to supply or sellers. Well, if sellers anticipate something happen in the future, that can affect supply in the present. So if you own an oil well and anticipate oil prices decreasing in the future, you may ramp up your production now so that you can sell before the price falls. On the other hand, if your factory employs a lot of minimum wage workers and the minimum wage is scheduled to increase next year, you may ramp up production now so that you can sell before your costs increase. Our next determinant of supply is the number of sellers. So total supply or market supply is the sum of the supply curve of all suppliers. So if we have a new supplier, that would cause total supply to shift to the right. So initially when the electric scooters that you could rent first became started being popular, there were only a couple of companies that made them. And if you're in a big city, you might see one or two, you might see a Lime scooter. Or maybe there was one other company that um, had scooters around. Now there are so many companies that provide scooters. I think they're they're relatively inexpensive to make to buy the scooter. Um, the apps are pretty simple for these companies to make, and so we have lots of them. And there are now scooters everywhere. Um, and I used to live in D.C. They you would trip over them. Everyone who lived there hated them. And there were all these different companies, so supply increased a lot. 